Welcome to ICANN, a podcast about ophthalmology through a uniquely Canadian lens with Dr. Cedare Ziai and myself, Dr. Guillermo Rocha. The ICANN podcast has been made possible by support from MD Financial Management and Scotiabank, proud financial partners of the Canadian Ophthalmological Society and Canada's ophthalmologists. We'll share our experiences as ophthalmologists today and tackle some of the challenges we face as healthcare providers. Are you ready, Cedare? Let's do it, Guillermo. Let's do it, Cedare. On this episode of ICANN, we talk with Dr. Michael Nguyen, a fourth year ophthalmology resident at the University of Toronto, about what it's like being a resident today and the challenges that COVID has created in the learning and practice environment for new ophthalmologists. Dr. Michael Nguyen is a fourth year ophthalmology resident at the University of Toronto. He received his medical degree from McMaster University. Michael has a strong passion in ophthalmic medical education. More recently, he created the VISCO, the Virtual Introductory Student Course in Ophthalmology, a free and interactive online course that teaches the fundamentals of ophthalmology to medical students. He is currently serving as the president of the Council of Canadian Ophthalmology Residents. And I have the pleasure of working with you, Michael, because as you know, I'm the board liaison on the Canadian Ophthalmological Society for Residents and Young Ophthalmologist Affairs. So it's nice to have you on the podcast, my friend. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's get right into it, Michael. Tell us quickly before we get into the nitty gritty of resident life. Um, how did you get it? How did you get interested in ophthalmology? And what are you hoping? What are your hopes? What are your plans? As, as vague as you want to leave them, tell us what you're, what you're imagining for your own future. So I had a very specific vision of what it meant to be a doctor. And for me, it was all about improving patient quality of life. Throughout medical school, I looked at different specialties and tried to figure out which was a perfect match for me. And I landed on ophthalmology. And I really feel like as ophthalmologists, as you both know, you, we can really improve patient quality of life more than any other specialty, in my opinion. For me, I recently started doing my cataract surgery training and nothing is more gratifying than seeing my patients post-op so happy, so grateful in 2020. And I think that um, we really are blessed to be in this field. Uh, for me, I really feel that I do wanna provide some comprehensive care to my community, wherever that community ends up being. So I'm interested in also pursuing uh, possibly a pediatric fellowship to also provide that care also to that population. So that's great, Michael, and it's great having you on this podcast. Um, I'd like to get your impressions a little bit as to now that you're finishing your residency, you're in the final stages, compared to the beginning and smack in the middle, we were faced with those challenges with the pandemic. How has your life changed in that regard? Um, how have you found opportunities as well? And how would you think, maybe thinking about when uh, Cedare and I did our residencies way back when, uh, how do you think your experience is being different in this uh, day and age? I think right now, at least in this modern era, it's probably the best and worst time to be a resident uh, at this very moment. I say best time because, you know, thanks to a lot of advocacy done by different house staff organizations in each province, for example, in Ontario, we have the Professional Associations for Residents in Ontario, or PARO, of which um, I was the ophthalmology representative last year. They've made great strides over the last couple of decades to um, help advocate for residencies, introducing things like call stipends, whereas before residents were not even paid uh, extra on top of their salary to be on call. More recently, last year, we really advocated for pandemic pay for residents in Ontario because uh, different nurses and other healthcare uh, professions were getting pandemic pay, but residents were left kind of in the dark. And that's something that we really pushed for for our uh, resident members. And I think that Paro has really made great strides in improving um, resident quality of life. Uh, at the same time, I think that because of COVID, there's been a lot of challenges that we've had to face, um, most obviously with the lowering of surgical numbers, um, especially in a surgical specialty with a lot of outpatient procedures. A lot of our training does happen in outpatient operating rooms. 
And because of COVID and the closures of these elective oper operating rooms, we haven't had the same uh, opportunities necessarily to uh, practice our surgical techniques. Are you guys still feeling the weight of that, Michael? I know pretty much most of us are ramping up or ramped up back to full capacity, but is it still, a, I know it was a very major concern for our residents at, in Ottawa, but now that we've ramped up, are you guys feeling relief or do you still feel like you will forever have this sensation that you're behind because you lost those months? What is, what is, this, what is the feeling? What are you hearing through the grapevine? Uh, I think it's probably different for each program, at least for me. I think I'm very thankful. Uh, the faculty at the University of Toronto have been tremendously helpful in understanding uh, and have really worked to help increase our surgical volume for trainees. And in fact, I think our current PGY5 cohort will actually graduate with the highest number of cataracts ever in the history of the program in Toronto due to a lot of um, advocacy by our faculty to help uh, push numbers. We even have, uh, we even opened a fifth operating room in our main cataract OR, maybe not specifically because of COVID, but also to help with this. So we increased our volumes by, you know, 25%. Um, so I think that there's been a lot of positives to come from COVID as well. And this obviously will feed forward to the incoming residents as well, because they'll get to benefit from this new structure. Um, so I think that at least for Toronto, we've been very lucky to um, I think that not only have we caught up, but I think we're going to be exceeding some of our uh, past uh, co-residents. So, Michael, how do you think now that you're kind of on the last legs of your program and you've seen different things, uh, both in the program, both in the world and and sort of you were mentioning a lot about the well-being of residents. How do you think uh, moving forward, you would improve the, the experience for the residents um, that are coming behind you? I think that physician wellness and you know resident wellness are becoming increasingly put in the spotlight over the past few years. And I think it's for good reason. I really believe that in order to provide the best care for our patients, we have to take care of ourselves. When I was a medical student at McMaster University, uh, the curriculum had already started telling us about what it meant to be a well-rounded physician, not only in our medical care towards our patients, but also our bedside manner, and even to in ways for us to take care of ourselves, self-care. Um, I remember in first year, we had a two hour uh, meditation class. It was like a lecture on mindfulness meditation. And I think at that point in time, I thought it was a little hokey, but ever since then, I honestly have been meditating for, you know, 10 minutes every day um, since that time. And I think that it was because of that, that's really helped me, uh, you know, put more emphasis on taking care of myself. And especially as I now uh, am operating taking that time to, to sit down in the mornings to be still with my mind and my body has been really helpful for dealing with the stresses that come inevitably in the operating room um and i think that you know like not to say that a lot of our learning doesn't happen when we're on call or when we're seeing large volumes of patients and of course there's always a service component to residency and these are all important parts of becoming a competent physician but i think that there are ways to achieve those goals um, while also ensuring that residents don't burn out and lose compassion for taking care of our patients quality of life which is the thing that you know most of us went into medicine to do so it would be a shame that if we lost that during residency at the expense of these other goals that we're also trying to achieve um, at the same time so i think that uh, especially with new um, innovations by the Royal College, for example, with competency by design, it's really going to be helpful to target different residents and address different needs. Not every resident obviously progresses at the same rates. Different residents may need help at different stages of their training. And I think that that will be very helpful in helping residents, um, you know, are able to become competent. Excellent. Actually, Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, that was my next question for you. We as staff have been hearing so much about CBME we actually did a podcast also on it. And so we have our own point of view on how this is going to affect um, our teaching and, um, you know, our day-to-day -day interactions with the residents. What, what, are you, what are you guys hearing? I guess it's not going to affect you as much because you'll, be, um, you'll be almost done really once it's fully implemented. But is the general feeling amongst the resident body that this is going to be a positive change or a cumbersome change? What are you, what are you guys thinking about CBME coming into the programs? I think that, especially, at least for Toronto, our uh, PGY4 and PGY5 year when we're operating, we already have 
a very robust and rigorous evaluation scale. So at the end of every single operating uh, room day, the faculty sit down with us. We look at all the cases that we did together. We grade, you know, what percentage of which cases that we did, whether or not they were simple or whether they were hyper mature or small pupils or IFAS or other complications. Um, and we, you know, look at how many of the cases we're able to successfully do. And then the faculty grade us actually on a scale compared to other trainees at our level where we're expected to be based on the number of cases that we've done. So I think that at least for PGY four and five, this has already been quite implemented for many years now. I think the challenge comes in, you know, PGY two and three, and especially in ophthalmology, where a lot of the other things that we do in our profession are not really two player games, like learning how to laser retinal tears, for example, can be challenging if there's no teaching scope, or even having conversations about informed consent about doing the laser or doing different surgeries, we often don't have our faculty directly observe us. So I think that that would be a very welcome change. But I think the implementation uh, can be quite rocky. And I think there'll be a lot of growing pains. But I know that a lot of ophthalmology programs like Queens has already been implementing this for a while. So we'll be glad to learn from their experiences for sure. ICANN wants to know what you think. Please send your comments on today's episode or any suggestions you may have for topics or features to communications at cos-sco.ca and we'll try to incorporate them into future episodes. The ICANN podcast has been made possible by support from MD Financial Management and Scotiabank proud financial partners of the Canadian Ophthalmological Society and Canada's ophthalmologists. Hi, I'm Dr. Hadi Saheb, glaucoma specialist at McGill University of Montreal, and I listen to the ICANN podcast. Michael, seems like you you have a lot on your plate. You're uh, doing residency, you're learning surgery, you also are uh, organizing uh, the course. Uh, but very importantly, you're the president of the Council for Canadian Ophthalmology Residents. So what, what does that involve to you? And uh, what are the main issues that uh, your group of residents are trying to bring forward or are concerned about? Can you so tell us a bit more about that? Mm -hmm. So the, Cana uh, the Council of Canadian Ophthalmology Residents, or CCOR, is a committee of the Canadian Ophthalmological Society, the COS. We have seven elected ophthalmology residents, including myself, where I'm currently serving as president, and we have a faculty advisor, Dr. Zi. Um, and really, we're a platform uh, for resident collaboration, for advocacy. We help disseminate educational and uh, career planning resources. And we host a resident targeted uh, symposium at the COS annual meeting, as well as other social events throughout the year. Um, you know, for the last couple of years, we've really been dealing with uh, COVID and how that has limited our ability to not only get together at the COS in person, but also to run other events throughout the year. With the advent of Zoom, you know, for all its um, pros and cons, we've been able to implement uh, more Zoom events, and that has been very helpful in getting the entire national resident body together to learn about uh, different, for example, fellowship opportunities was one of the events that we did last year. We had fellows from every subspecialty uh, who graduated in Canada come and give talks on the, what the process was like to match to these fellowships. And this year, as one of my mandates as president, I really wanted to engage with the medical students who are interested in ophthalmology in Canada. I think that these students you know, are, are gonna be our future peers and colleagues. And I think that by mentoring them, we can really ensure the success of the future of our field by having bright stars come through our programs throughout all of Canada. And one of the initiatives that I helped create this year with some medical students is called COMP or the Canadian Ophthalmology Mentorship Program. And it's a program that pairs resident mentors with medical student mentees from across Canada to help with networking and career exploration. I think we currently have over 120 medical students and 40 residents from all across Canada um, that are helping to um, you know, mentor and teach these medical students. And I've been finding it very great, uh, gratifying to interact with students who I may not normally ever speak to from different provinces, different medical schools, and help them with their fears and aspirations for entering ophthalmology. It's been uh, really gratifying because I know for myself, I have a lot of faculty mentors and uh, they've been incredibly helpful to me throughout the stages of my training. 
And another aspect of this course that we were planning is to have a monthly mentorship webinars uh, with discussions with ophthalmologists and the residents about the various dimensions of the practice of ophthalmology and career. And I think that last September we had uh, our first session with Dr. Radicoli on equity, diversity, and inclusion in ophthalmology, which is a very important topic. And um, each month we have a different topic as well. So I think that that has been one of the uh, mandates that I've been really trying to push for this year. There are other things that are coming through as well. We want to branch out and start collaborating with other uh, organizations outside the COS, for example, with Orbis um, and other organizations in Canada to help uh, with uh, patient advocacy as well. That's great, Michael. That's a That sounds like an initiative you know, one of those ones that you hear about it and you wonder why it didn't exist before. So congratulations on on building that. And so as we had mentioned during your introduction, you also are involved in, or you created, I guess, this program called VISCO, very appropriately named Virtual Introductory Student Course in Ophthalmology. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so Visco is, was a free, uh, I mean, it's still free, but it completed. It's a free uh, virtual six week ophthalmology uh, course that took place in the summer of 2021. So just this last summer. And it was presented by ophthalmology uh, faculty and residents across Canada. Um, we had over nine interactive two hour workshops. We created a curated reading list from different various free um, resources that have been vetted by faculty ophthalmologists um, uh, on the internet so that people can access it for free. And we even managed to get funding so that we were able to have gift cards for uh, student participation. And really, Visco was um, inspired by TORIC, which is the Toronto Ophthalmology Residency Introductory Course, uh, which is a six-week boot camp that all end of PGY-1 residents from all over Canada come to Toronto for six weeks and they uh, learn the basics of our field. So we wanted to kind of replicate that um, to a more simple extent for medical students across Canada, um, any who wanted to learn more about ophthalmology. In fact, over last year, we had over 300 medical students attend from across Canada. We even had a fair number of students from the United States and even from other countries around the world, like Uganda and places in South America as well. So we were very glad to have such a global audience participate in this course. Uh, we're currently uh, planning for the second year uh, for Visco, and we're very excited to produce an even more fun educational and dynamic course than last year. Oh, it's truly amazing everything that you're involved with and, and the impact that you're having uh, not only in your own generation but um, also in the generations to come and frankly even I think in the older generations because I think you're inspiring many of us to to do more things in terms of education and uh, collaboration. So I do have a question for you, Michael. I, I have occasional uh, medical students that spend time with me and you can see the um, the uh, angst about, you know, they, many of them are, are really looking forward to entering in ophthalmology. So now that you're kind of almost there to finish as an ophthalmologist, um, what would your present self would have told your old self years ago? What, what is the reality of the situation? How feasible it is? What advice would you give the younger generations that are really, really passionate about entering our field? I think that you know our field, for better or worse, is very uh, selective. There, the, the, the honest truth of it is that there aren't that many spots in Canada. And unfortunately, there are a lot of very capable candidates who want to enter into ophthalmology. Um, so you know, my first advice, I guess, to my past self would be that if this is something that you're truly passionate in, if you really want to be in this field, I think that ophthalmology is by far the best field to be in. And I think I'm only finding out that every year I progress the residency, I find that it's even better. Like every year, every, like as I get closer and closer to uh, finishing residency, I discover more things about the field that make me even more passionate and even more excited um, to be uh, in the field. So I think that ophthalmology is the best decision that you can make, but it is one that you really have to commit yourself to. I don't think that uh, you can really um, not put all your effort into uh, getting into ophthalmology because it's very challenging. And my other uh, piece of advice is a bit controversial, but I think that um, I think that medicine is actually in general such an interesting field. And you know there are over thirty specialties you can apply to in CARMS, and it's kind of crazy because you don't you can't even name um, thirty different types of medical specialties probably. 
uh, because internal medicine is only just one specialty that you apply to in CARMS. There's 29 other fields that you can enter to. And I think that it's probably a bit disingenuous if you think that ophthalmology is the only thing that you can do with your life. I think that there are many other specialties that are also almost as incredible as ophthalmology. And I think that they would be very lucky to have someone who is excited and passionate about that field as well. So I think that um, ophthalmology is the best, but I think there are other fields that um, you can look into as well. That's great. Now we have a few minutes where Saturday and I can convince you to go into cornea because that is even <laughs> better. <laughs> yes, you are. We're, we're, you're outnumbered if you're interested in anything else. <laughs> exactly. Michael, it was really nice to have you on the show. I'm really excited um, to see what your endeavors bring. I'm also very much looking forward to our um, next COS meeting in person where we get to actually have this resident half day happen properly. It's been far too long and um, I've appreciated working with you this year um, as the board liaison. And um, you know, it's, it's really been lovely speaking to you tonight and best of luck with all your upcoming projects. All the best, Michael, really. I'm, I'm very impressed with everything you've done and it, it is truly an inspiration. Uh, for our field in general. And, and I'm, I'm sure if people listen to this uh, outside of Canada, they will be inspired as well to achieve similar things in their countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it and feel honored to be here. Thank you to our guest, Dr. Michael Nguyen, for joining us this week. We look forward to bringing you more episodes. And for our next episode... We've got a little surprise for you. We have our very own Saturday ZIA sharing her views on what it is to be a woman in ophthalmology and all the different projects that she has developed. ICANN wants to know what you think. Please send your comments on today's episode or any suggestions you may have for topics or features to communications at cos-sco.ca and we'll try to incorporate them into future episodes. The ICANN podcast has been made possible by support from MD Financial Management and Scotiabank proud financial partners of the Canadian Ophthalmological Society and Canada's ophthalmologists. Thank you to the Canadian Ophthalmological Society. The ICANN podcast is written and directed by Eric Johnson and produced by John Allaire from Allaire Strategic Works.